uh, I get the opportunity to bring to a close uh, our series called This Is Us, and it uh, talks about what's special to us as a church here at Milton Keynes Christian Centre. It's not unique to us, or these values are not unique to us, but they're important to us, and they help to describe what our church family is like and how we act together and how it guides our actions. Uh, last week, Mark spoke to us about lost people matter to God, so they must matter to us. Yes? yes. I mean, they must matter. And we make decisions based on not the people who are already in this church. We make decisions on people who are outside of the church and need to know Jesus. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, we used to have a, a Christmas morning service, and uh, it was all Christians that came to it. So we decided we'd jack that in and we'd start a Christmas Eve service. And we've got hundreds and thousands of people coming to hear about Jesus on Christmas Eve. A great move, yes? yes? People matter to us. So we'll make decisions to influence the people's lives outside of this church. We've talked about we're given to generosity. And so many of us came and gave last week, uh, or at least pledged to give over this next year, to see uh, the money that we give, given away into our community and into the world through the work of Light Force International. And I shared with you last week that over the last uh, 11 or so years, we've given away 1.55 million pounds. Isn't that just fantastic? <laughs> giving it away. Just giving it away to people that need it. You don't seem, you're all Scottish you are. You want to hold on to this money. You don't seem very happy about that. But sometimes they can be more challenging than that. We've talked about we're forgiven uh, to forgive. And, you know, we try to choose grace over judgment. We try to not write people off uh, when they make a mistake. And it's hard sometimes to do that because so often people want us to write people off when, they make a mis when somebody else makes a mistake, yes? yes. Sometimes we could be like that. We want, we want God's grace, but we don't want it for everybody else. And so it's hard to do that sometimes. But there's one value which I have a bittersweet relationship with. I voted not to have it, but we're, we've got it. So I've got to talk to you about it. And it says we're bringing our best. We want to excel in all that we do so that we inspire others, honor God, and bring a smile to his face. And, you, you know, I don't have, the reason I don't like it is because I don't have a very good relationship with the word best, or even more importantly, my best. I've been fighting with this thing called my best well, I've turned 60, but I've been fighting with it for at least 50 years. Um, because I believe that my best is never good enough. Anybody feel like that sometimes? Yes. Your best is never good enough. And rather than bringing a smile to God's face, he very often looks at me at best in pity. And at worst, he's maybe a little bit disappointed and maybe a little bit angry with me. Because my best is never good enough. It's never going to inspire everybody else. Because you see, when your best is not good enough, you, come, you become very good at looking at other people and telling them that their best is not good enough either. You ever be there? You always find something missing, something that takes away from being good. And so where does this come from? Well, two things conspired in my childhood growing up um, that I think gives me this bad relationship with my best. The first one was, I've got, I mean, I've got, you know, I mean, I've talked to you long enough now. I, I, I am, like, some people are passionate about people. I am passionate about sports, okay? I'm you watching the rugby last night, all the South Africans here. Um, and and, and I, I just loved any sort of sport, no matter what it was, I wanted to play it, and, and, and the only problem was, no matter what the sport was, I was absolutely pathetic at every single one of them. I tried everything, even tiddlywinks. I was rubbish at that as well. And it wasn't because I didn't practice. I practiced harder than anybody. You know when they tell you you can be anything you want to be? 
you, these people that come on, Britain's Got Talent in the singing contest and they can't sing. Well, that's like me in sport. And it doesn't matter how much I tried, I was never going to be any good at it. I was always last to be picked. You know, at school, pick, pick people up. I was always last. They tried to give me away to the other team because they didn't want me. Um, I was painfully weak, slow, unbalanced, and the list goes on. And now years later, I realize that it wouldn't have mattered how much I practiced my problems were mainly caused by a genetic disorder called CMT, charcot marie tooth disease. And every nerve in my body is defective, so it sends the wrong signals to all the muscles in my body so they don't develop. And it doesn't matter how much I practiced, this was going to stop me from being any good at sport. And then there was a second thing that happened to me, or a second factor that came into it. You know... My mom often, now my mom loved me, but she often compared me to others, especially when it came to my schoolwork. Any of you guys do that with your kids? Comparing to somebody else? So-and-so does really well. Well, I was two, my two friends were, were, were a couple of twins, and they were brain boxes. I mean, they didn't even have to study and they could pass exams. And, and, uh, and so... Even when I passed, I failed. Because when I said to my mom, I passed, and she said, well, couldn't you be more like James and Andrew because they've got A's and not C's? You with me? And, and, and so I, I, being compared to somebody else, my good enough was never good enough. And I remember, well, I've told you this before, I remember once I came home from school because I'd done a maths exam, and I came home to tell my mom that I had done really well on this exam. I got 99%. And she said, it's a pity about the 1%. <laughs> yes, I'm officially screwed up. And the, the first thing I'd like to say is that in the Christian life, it's not based on my good enough. It's based on his good enough. Yes. Our best cannot obtain our salvation. Our best cannot keep our salvation. You've got to understand that. The best definition of the gospel I've ever heard was by a guy called Tim Keller. And he said this, fully known, fully loved. Fully known, fully loved. So it's about his best. But as I read scripture, I discover that often Jesus asked people to bring the best. He did. Can you remember the rich young ruler who had lots of money? He says, if you want to follow me, what does he say? Sell everything you've got. Bring your best. Sell everything you've got and come follow me. To the woman caught in adultery, we see a massive picture of God's grace. Yes? But what does he say? Go and don't sin any more. Whoa. God's grace, forgiveness, but go and don't sin any more. And to his disciples, he said, it's not about loving the people that love you. It's about loving your enemies. How do we work that through? Have you been watching the TV over the last week or so, a couple of weeks? And I've, I don't profess to have any answers for the mess that is happening in the Middle East. But it's just hatred for each other, isn't it? But in the kingdom of God, we're told to love our enemies, to bring our best. And the list goes on. Because of Christ's best, we have the security and the freedom to give our best. And, you know, one right into the Colossian believers, Paul tells them to stop trying to live up to a list of rules and regulations that were being imposed by some of the teachers, but because they had been made alive through Christ, through the work of Christ, they could live a different way. And through because he has brought our salvation and because he secured our salvation, we can live a different way by bringing our best to God every single day. Colossians 3:17 says this, "And whatever you do, in word 
or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever. Do everything. A couple of verses later, Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Actually, that word translated there, heartedly, it actually means out of. So whatever you do, work out of the Lord, not out of men. That's what we've got to do. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You will receive. You, you are serving the Lord Christ. And you know, it's always important to look at the context of where that scripture comes from. Sometimes we take scripture and we rip it out of the context. We've got this favorite verse and we rip it out and we don't put it in the context. So the next few minutes, I'm just going to read some scripture. Is that okay? I'm just going to read some scripture, maybe comment along the way, but I want to give you the context that Paul puts these two verses that we've just read. So we're going to go back to the verse one. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on the things that are above. What does that mean? Think about, set your mind on everything that is above. That's the first thing we've got to do with our best, to give our best. Whatever we do, we're going to do this as well as we can to the Lord to think, to set our minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. So we're not thinking about the things around us and everything that we, all the trials and all the things that go on in our life or all the things that we want in our lives. We're going to think on Jesus that's where our minds are, are put. We used to say sometimes in college, that, like Bible college, that guy was so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. You ever heard that one? I'm not sure if you can be too heavenly minded, because that's what Paul's t- saying. Be heavenly minded. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the earth. Verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death. So we've got to have our minds set on the things that are above. That's some of the whatever we have to do heartily. Set our minds on the things that are above. And then put to death, therefore, what is earthly, as opposed to the heavenly in you. What are they? Sexual immorality, Immaturity, uh, sorry, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. That last little bit, that could be better translated. Wanting more and more is devil worship. <laughs> Who wants more and more? We want more of the, the earthly things, but he's saying that's, that's devil worship. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So we've got to set our minds on the things that are above. We've got to put to death the things of this earth in our, in our life. Um, verse 7, in, in the, these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away or get rid of this stuff from our lives. We've got to move it out. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from the mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self, or the other word is stripped, stripped away, taken it off with all its practices. And I've put on, so we've taken some stuff off, And now we're putting some stuff back on. We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge 
after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, free, slave free, but Christ is all, or it could be better said, Christ is all that matters. And he's in, Christ is in all. Verse 12, again, put on. So when we're doing these things, we're setting our minds on things, whatever we do, do it heartily. Set our minds on the things that are above. Take off and strip off and put to death all the stuff that is contrary to God and is in this world. Not to be pursuing more and more, but to be pursuing more and more of Jesus. Put on then as chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. Or the Greek could be put this way, putting up with one another. I like that one. Put up with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive others. Or another way to put this, I like if if you use the the, the original uh, Greek words that are in there, it means if, if one has a complaint against another, gracing each other as the Lord has graced you so that you must grace others. I I, I like that way of putting it. Isn't that wonderful? As he's graced us, then we grace other people. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony And let the peace of Christ rule or umpire in our hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. See these words that that Paul uses about this life in Christ. He says, love, peace, gratitude, and thankfulness has got to be part of our everyday life. We sang about being thankful earlier, didn't we? Verse 16 What must we do to help us to give our best? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and worship team. Paul says we can sing hymns. Sorry, it's a private joke. (laughs) Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. And we get to the verse we read earlier. And whatever you do, in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And then, following on from that verse, he then starts to talk about relationships between husband and wife parent and, and, and kids, masters and slaves. He talks about this relationship and he gets to verse, um, verse 20, 23. So he's already, these are the things that you've got to do. We spoke about earlier. Then he talks about our relationships with, between each other, uh, families and everything like that. So in the context of families and relationships that we've got, he says, whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So in your marriage, you're just serving your wife or your kids. You're serving the Lord Lord Christ. That's what he's saying. In these normal, everyday things, We have to change our mentality and not think about earthly things, about getting more and more from this other person, but it's about giving more and more because we are serving the Lord Christ. We've got to bring our best in our marriages, yes? 
All the women shout yes and the blokes are quiet. Come on, blokes! Come on! You are serving the Lord Christ. We've got to set our minds on heaven. We have got to kill sin in our life. We have got to clothe ourselves with God's character. And lastly, I want to speak to you about the other thing that we are told continually in Scripture that we have got to do. We have got to keep the unity of the Spirit. As a prisoner of the Lord, sorry, Ephesians, Ephesians 4. As a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Worthy of the calling. You know, that's a phrase that Paul come back, comes back to time and time again. He uses the same phrase when he writes to the Romans, the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, the Thessal, Thessal, people from Thessalonica. How do you say that? Um, <laughs> He uses the same phrase over and over again. Bring a life, I urge you to live a life worthy or appropriate to the calling that you have got in God. So we have got to live a life that is worthy of what Jesus has done for us. Worthy of the calling. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, or that could be translated, do one's best to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I haven't got time to read through the next scripture I was going to, but if you go home tonight and read Romans 14. It's a really interesting chapter because Paul is speaking to the the, the Roman believers who are met in seven or eight different house churches and they're having difficulty and disagreements with each other. Can you believe that happens in church? And, and, And there was a disagreement over two things particularly. One was some people thought you had to keep the Sabbath special. And a whole load of other people thought you didn't have to keep the, the, the Sabbath special. It was every day, yes? And then there was another group of people who thought you should only... You should, they were all vegetarians. Boo. Anyway, there were, there were vegetarians. And then there was people on this side, and I was in this group, and we were meat, carbonate, carbonate. Right? We just love meat. Give us more meat. And they were falling out about the two things. And the two of them were at each other's throats. You know what I mean? How can you only eat vegetables? You're weird. You know what I mean? You're killing the animals and they're and they're falling out and the unity in the church is being destroyed because of food in special days. And Paul is going, what do you think you're doing? Like, I think it's not about what you eat and I think it's, I mean, I'm in Paul's camp. He thinks it's okay to eat, eat, uh, eat, eat uh, what is it, meat. And he doesn't think it is a special. I'm in that camp. But he's going, guys, you're destroying God's work because of food and special days. He goes, if you believe you should just eat vegetables, then do it. With, be passionate about it. Like, go for it with every fiber of your being, but don't cause the people who want to eat meat to stumble. The same the other way around. And we can be in the same church and we can, have, we can have complete disagreements about certain things that we think are important because it's between me and God. Don't mess with me and God, but I'm not going to mess with you and God. You got me? This is what... Oh, no. Here we go. I'm, I'm nowhere near finished yet. And, 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 and so... We've got to understand there's some things we can hold passionately about and it's okay for somebody else who's a Christian who's my brother and my sister and they believe something completely different. But there's other things that you can't believe different about. Okay? But the problem is we get them mixed up. So there's three buckets. Can you imagine three buckets? I should have had them, but I haven't. Three buckets. One, bucket one. This, are, this is things that we can't change. If you don't believe this stuff, you're not a Christian church. We believe in the Bible. 
There's God's word. We believe in sin. We believe in Jesus came as a ransom. We believe in the atonement. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe he's coming again. There's certain things that if you don't believe this, then we've got to part company. You okay? Then there's another bucket, which is in the middle, which is doctrines and things that are in the Bible that there's a lot of disagreement about. Okay? Um, like, I know what's right, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so, like, doctrines about the end times, okay? Lots of different doctrines about the end times. If you want to know, I'll come and see me afterwards. I'll tell you, but don't worry. Um, but we, um, gifts of the Spirit. Some people believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for now, and some people believe that they're not for now, and they're gone, yes? Um, some people believe that uh, you can't, if you're a female, you can't be a leader in the church. And other people believe that that's okay, we're all the same. You, you with me? So some people, there's, there's two big debates, a big debate in the church about Calvinism or Arminianism. You don't even know what that is, probably half of you. I, but you see... Some of these things are important, and it might mean that we have to find a group of people and a family that believe some of the things the same as me. You with me? And I can't can't fellowship in that church in that way. I can't go there every week because I just don't see that. But it doesn't mean that they're not Christian, and it doesn't mean we can't have fellowship with that other church. They just see things a little bit differently to we do. We don't write things on Facebook, slamming them, they're just, they're just different, yes? You don't really seem convinced about that. And then there's another bucket over here, which Paul puts in eating meat, eating vegetables, days, Sundays, all that sort of stuff, political parties. Um, what, what else have we got? What else can we put in this? Anybody, anything else we can put in this bucket? Football teams, yes. <laughs> Rugby. Oh, no. Um, But the problem is, we get the buckets mixed up. And we end up around this bucket on the stuff that we shouldn't be arguing about. And we fall out all the time over it. There's nothing wrong with believing something different. Paul says, believe it with all your heart. Go for it. It's between you and God, but don't bring judgment into somebody else's life because they believe something a little bit different to you. On the first bucket, yes. But on the second and third, we've got to understand. You with me? So he says, strive. Strive to keep the unity. Put to death. Keep our minds focused in God. Put to death. Put on God. Let me just read. Must be serious, I've got my Bible. There's a book in the Old Testament called Malachi. And God is speaking to his people. In the first, first, it's not on the screen, first chapter. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, How have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. What he's saying is that the priests 
looked at everything they had. They looked at their flocks. They looked at everything. And they had to bring a sacrifice to God. And they looked at the abundance of everything that they'd been given by God. And they say, I'll give him the one that's only got three legs. I'll give him the blind. I'll give him the broken. I'll give him the bits that I don't want. And God says, that's not your best. And I certainly don't want to bring condemnation into this place. But God wasn't prepared to accept the sacrifices because they brought him the dregs. In, in our lives, we can't bring God the dregs. We've got to bring him the best. Yes? The best of everything that we've got. Our time, our talent, our treasure to do whatever we can. Whatever we can to do it heartily unto the Lord. Amen.